I am honored to get to co MC this town hall with Council Member Shama Sawant. <laughs> and I want to tell you guys a little bit about uh, how we met a couple years ago after I got the shit beat out of me by three guys who followed me home after leaving a gay bar. So I'm going to be a little bit of a Debbie Downer for a minute. Um, really close to the intersection of Pine and Boylston, I heard a friendly voice behind me say, hey, and I turned around to a smiling white guy and his friends who looked about my age, and he decked me with a blunt object, and I was immediately knocked unconscious. I don't know how long I was out for, but it was long enough for the blood from the gash on my forehead to trickle its way along my scalp, through my hair, and crust up on the back of my head where I was lying face up on the concrete. When I regained consciousness, two girls were hovering over me. They called the police for me as my phone had been stolen. I went to Harborview Medical and got stitches for the gash in my forehead. I was told that the hole from the inside of my gums through to the outside of my face would heal on its own. In my anger and frustration, I wrote a letter to Mayor Murray, Council Member Sawant, and City Attorney Pete Holmes holding them accountable for the violence that could have killed me. I asked, What's going on? Is this amount of violent crime on Capitol Hill normal, or is it on the rise? Is my neighborhood becoming an unsafe place to live, or has it always been so? If crime is on the rise in Capitol Hill, what are your theories to explain the rise? What is the city doing to try to make it better? What can I do? Mayor Murray called me and told me that I should advocate for more police, more funding for the Seattle Police Department, and better training for the police. And I was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Shama Sawant's response was really different. She immediately messaged me on Facebook to ask me if I was okay and if she could do anything for me personally. Ever organizing, I was like, can you come to this peace vigil this weekend that I'm organizing? She couldn't, unfortunately, but she shared her thoughts with me and I read them aloud at the peace vigil. She said... To put an end to the violence and the culture of violence, we need to address the root causes which are often linked to social and economic inequality. We need an empowered community to ensure that the elected leadership of our city and our police department are accountable to the public safety needs of our community. We need a cultural transformation of our society into one that has a zero tolerance of violence, hate crimes, verbal and physical harassment. She probably didn't realize how seriously I would take to heart what she wrote. But here we are today. We are working together to address the root cause. The poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting richer. As wealth accumulates at the top, those of us at the bottom are resorting to bludgeoning each other for a $20 bill and an iPhone. Shifting the tax burden from the poor to the rich is one small step in the right direction. And today we're here to do that. So thank you everyone for coming. And Shama, it's all yours. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel is an excellent example of somebody who doesn't get cowed by personal difficulties, but turns it towards political activism. Thank you all for being here today, being part of our movement. Washington State has the most regressive tax system in the entire nation. So our regressive tax system means that the poor and the working class pay far more in taxes than the super rich. As Seattle Times columnist Jerry Large wrote just last month, this state relies on a rotten tax system. None of this should com come as a surprise to us, of course, because money is power under capitalism, and big business and the super rich use their immense wealth to control the political system and to buy the elections of the political establishment around the country. So, of course, our local tax system is regressive. Regressive taxes are grossly unjust, but it is more than that. Regressive taxes create a mathematical problem. When those of us who are the lowest income and the middle class and are taxed the most, and the 
and big corporations are taxed the least, it means that it adds up to very little money to fulfill the needs of our society. All across the state, the public school system is crumbling, not for lack of dedication and talent on the part of our educators, but because the state legislature has completely failed to fund it at the same time that they continue to give sweetheart deals to the extortionist executives of corporations like Boeing. And despite untold wealth in our city, the problem of homelessness and the housing affordability crisis continue to escalate. Social services and mental health services have remained chronically underfunded. And now, to top it all, Trump's right-wing and billionaire-filled administration wants to further cut social programs and transit funding. Are we going to let that happen? No! <laughs> hell no, that's a great, great response. You should tweet at Donald Trump, hell no. <laughs> We might actually get a response from him. <laughs> but right now in Seattle, we have the real possibility of forcing establishment politicians to pass a city income tax ordinance, in other words, an ordinance to tax Seattle's richest people. What a long way we've come from 2015 when we ran our District 3 City Council re-election campaign with the demand to tax the rich. The reason we've come this far in just two years is only because of the grassroots movement built by the activists and working people of our city. The Trump-proof Seattle Coalition, the neighborhood action groups, homeless organizers, regular working people and young people, but particularly the Transit Riders Union under the leadership of Katie Wilson, the the Economic Opportunity Institute with John Burbank, and socialist alternative activists, all of whom have helped put Tax the Rich on Seattle's agenda since 2015. And I thank Councilmember Herbold for joining me on the council in support of our Trump-proof Seattle coalition. However, when we get close to winning, there is always the danger that we can grow complacent and let up the pressure. Are we going to let up the pressure? No. There is the danger that the right wing of the council and the mayor might try to water down the legislation. For example, council members Burgess and Bagshaw have spoken in favor of a flat tax on everyone, not just the rich, when the resolution they said this when the resolution was voted a few weeks ago. But make no mistake, we are against, we are against any more taxes on poor and working class and middle class people. We are taxed too much already. We are talking about taxing the rich. So, are we going to fight to win? Yeah. Today we have some amazing speakers and class fighters to explain Trump-proof Seattle's proposal to tax the rich and to lay out the strategy to build this amazing movement. We're going to have scheduled speakers that Daniel and I will take turns in introducing, and then after that we will, have, we will open it up for a question and answer session. Awesome. I, uh... I'm going to welcome to the stage my friend Ty Nolan. He is trained as a traditional Native American storyteller. Um, he has long used legends and ceremony in his work in mental health and education. He is a New York Times bestselling author and is internationally recognized for his work in HIV prevention and intervention. He is actively involved with the Greater Seattle Neighborhood Action Coalition as in an, and is in the process of joining the Seattle LGBTQ Commission. Ty Nolan. Nikhalawat, 
In English, my name is Ty. When we were children, our family had a performance group, and the first thing our dad told us before we got up before a crowd was to tell us, you don't just get up and hop around. For a lot of the people that you're about to meet, it's the only time they'll ever see real Indians. So you always use every teaching moment that you can. You don't just get up and hop around, you tell them what the movements mean. You tell them what the beadwork patterns mean, because everything has a meaning for us. And the drum that I'm using to start this off, it's a very special design. It represents a hawk's sun. And the hawk, rather than the eagle, has a special meaning where in the northwest where you are, it's portrayed with its beak coming back and touching itself again. And it represents renewal. It represents the idea of sustainable resources. And so that's what I want to do to begin, to remind us of why we're here to make a difference in terms of trying to be better people. And one of the things we'll do in Native American communities to start off an event is to sing a song that we call in English a working song. But probably more accurately, it's a purification or a cleansing song. So that as I sing it, to let go of the things that you might be holding on to, the pain or the frustrations, the thought of other things that you need to do or where you need to be, so that as you listen to this song, you can open yourself up, open up your heart, open up your mind to hear the words that will be shared with you tonight. Oh, oh, we oh. Thank you, Ty. As a longtime pastor and faith leader in Seattle's historic central district, our next speaker, Reverend Jeffrey, has witnessed firsthand the intense gentrification of our neighborhoods and the evisceration and displacement of black people and working people from our city. He has been at the forefront of social justice struggles, like the fight for 15, the renters' rights battles, and Black Lives Matter. He understands better than anyone the need for working people to unite together against economic inequality and racism. Please welcome Reverend Jeffrey. Thank you, Sharma. African Americans, the poor, and the middle class in the state of Washington are under siege by a trifecta of con consciously implemented policies which at their core serve to oppress, depress, and confine their economic growth and development. These policies are, <coughs> are not equitable and they are, first of all, a sales tax system, which is oppressive, a property tax system, which is oppressive, and the absence of both a state income tax system or any tax or dividend, any state tax or dividend, interest and interest on the wealthy. Although King County is one of the wealthiest counties in America, this wealth is not evenly spread. The medium income in King County is 36% more than the national average, according to recent census. However, four of the counties, 38 cities, and towns have incomes below the national average, but they still pay the same sales tax, the same percentage of property tax as the wealthy. There are presently seven states that don't pay income tax, and one of them is Washington State. However, however, even Tennessee, a southern state, 
has a sense to tax dividends and interest on the wealthy. So does Wyoming. Washington State depends solely on a regressive tax system of sales tax and property tax while giving huge breaks in property taxes to wealthy corporations like Boeing and like other corporations, Microsoft and everybody else, while giving little or no breaks to the poor or the middle class. Poor people are expected to pay the same tax rate as multimillionaires, as multi-billionaires pay. This is not just class warfare. This is a civil rights violation. As evidenced by the wholesale movement of African Americans out of a historical neighborhood, by redlining, by their being locked out and left out of the economic growth in this city and, <clears throat> and state, this is a true American tragedy. They have been forced to vacate their community and their culture, cultural heritage in order to avoid paying punitive and aggressive property taxes. We must, in the name of equity and fair play, fair play, abolish the sales tax in the state of Washington and adjust the property taxes, a property tax system, in order to make it equitable and make up the loss in revenue by imposing a state income tax on those who are wealthy and those who make over $250,000 a year. We must take, we must take, we must take the future of our city and state out of the hands of greedy politicians in bed with greedy developers and profiteers who are pricing the poor out of this city, that they have helped build a cultural city that they have helped implement and institute, putting their names on buildings, putting their images on buildings that are now owned by people who did not, who, who came in to this community is not enough. We cannot allow them to continually create a lily white city surrounded by people of color, the blacks, the Native American, the disenfr and the disenfranchised middle class, tax the rich. <laughs> tax the rich. Tax the bastards. was fantastic, Reverend Jeffrey. You know, no movement is complete without lively chants at our rallies and marches because they express what's on everybody's mind. So please give a warm welcome to our chant leaders. Awesome. Okay, now for a change of pace, a slideshow presentation. <laughs> Woo! How exciting! But we want everyone here to know exactly what is being proposed by the city. So KJ Moon, a resident of the Central District and an organizer with Transit Writers Union, uh, is going to come up here and give us an explanation of what exactly this ordinance will look like. KJ, when he's not organizing, works full-time as a software engineer and hangs out with the Seattle Democratic Socialists of America. Thank you, thank you so much. This is incredible. We managed to pack Washington Hall on a Thursday night for tax policy. So... 
up here, it's a little change of pace, but I'm going to talk to talk to you guys about the story of our estate and like two movements for an income tax in the state and how they failed and how we can succeed where they left off. So I'd like to begin the story in the Great Depression with robber barons, incredible inequality, and Hoovervilles who were popping up all over the United States. And if you can't recognize that up there in the top right corner, that's Yesler Tower right there, and that's a Hooverville in Seattle. And just like today, Seattle in the 1930s was facing a serious crisis of homelessness and um, unemployment. And so a movement was born from the Washington Grange Association. A group of farmers and a coalition created an initiative 69 to pass a progressive income tax in the state of Washington. And on this same ballot, was an initiative for the repeal of prohibition of alcohol. And I-69, the initiative for progressive taxation, passed by a far bigger margin than booze. And so the situation was quite serious. <laughs> but what happens when a group of grassroots organizers pass a progressive tax? Big business sued. And not so fast, from five to four, the 1930s ruling, um, the Supreme Court of Washington State declared that income is a form of property and under our state's constitution that all taxes on properties must be levied equally. And so the initiative failed. And 77 years later, a coalition led by the Economic Opportunities Institute uh, in 2010 tried it again to pass a progressive income tax for the state of Washington on high, wealthy households. And unfortunately, that failed as well from 64 to 36%. And it failed in every single county in the state of Washington, including ours, except for San Juan Island. And I'm not sure what's going on over there, but <laughs> it must be a great place to live. <laughs> but that brings us to today. And before I like to talk about today, I kind of want to get a gauge in this room on a scale 1 to 50, 1 being the fairest and the best state out of all 50 states in the United States, and 50 being the worst. Where do you think the state of Washington lies? And you can just shout out numbers from 1 to 50. Wow. Things are quite bad. <laughs> well, you guys are correct. We rank the worst. We are number one in the most regressive state in terms of state and local policy, tax policy out of all 50 states. And what does it mean when a tax policy is regressive? It means that the richer you get in this state, the less percent of your income you pay in state and local taxes. And if you look at that graph, and that graph is also on your seats, and if you're standing, we have um, handouts at the TRU table back there in yellow. You can see that in the lowest bracket, the lowest 20 bracket of our state, where households on average make about $12,000, they're paying 17%, or roughly 17% of their income in state and local taxes. On the flip side, you look at the top 1% of our state who are making about $1.5 million on average, and they pay roughly 3% in state and local income taxes. And that is tax injustice, and that is what it means for to have a regressive tax policy. And so some of you might think that, wait, it's not fair to lump us in with those on the east of the Cascades. We're Seattle, we're progressive. Surely our tax policy must be different than the state of Washington. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that Seattle's tax policy is the worst for the poor, and that we have the fourth highest tax burden in all 50 states, in all, in all cities in the United States, major cities, for those who are making $25,000 a year. And on the flip side, we have the fourth lowest taxes for those who are making $150,000 a year in this city. And now, and one interesting to note is that we are actually on both of those lists. So we have become a sanctuary city for money, not people. But some of you might argue it's been okay so far, right? Like, you know, our, city, our state has been chugging along. Our city has been, you know, somewhat chugging along. And wh why change now? 
but things are quite different today. We have a new administration, he who will not be named, <laughs> and his Republican cronies are, are threatening cuts, major cuts to education, health, housing, and environmental protection. And this is only going to exacerbate the housing crisis that we have, and among many other crises that our city faces. And so what do we do in our city where we need to fund something? We pass property tax levies. We increase the sales tax. Well, unfortunately, this year, we are taxed out. Mayor Ed Murray has proposed a, home, a property tax levy to address the housing crisis, and he has withdrawn that proposal in fears that it will not pass. Our King County Executive, Dow Constantine, has proposed, proposed an increase in sales tax to fund the arts. Our sales tax is around 10.2% right now, I believe. And he has withdrawn that proposal. Now, you know, a little different, but he actually put the proposal back on the ballot, but we'll see how it does in November or August. And so our, our, our city, our state, our country is starting to look like the 1930s. We have robber barons, but they just look a little different than they did in the 1930s. We have Nicholsville instead of Hooversville. And so we need to protect our residents and we need to save our city from Trump's agenda. As a group of community, environmental, labor activists, educators, from Democrats to socialists have got together to form the Trump-proof Seattle Coalition. It was actually really difficult to get all those logos to fit on that slide, to be honest. <laughs> and so this is our modest proposal. We propose a 1.5% tax on, house, on single tax filers who are making over $250,000 and half a million for joint filers. And when you get up to half a million in single filers and a million dollars in joint filers, we kick that rate up to 3%. And so if you look at the calculations, if you earn uh, $251,000 a year as a single filer, you pay $15 in taxes. And it's quite low, but it's a start, a modest proposal. And we expect to raise about $175 million for this city. Now, as Council Member Shama Swan has correctly said, that we, this is a negotiable process with the rest of the city council and our coalition. So these numbers may change in the future, but I think we're pretty set on them. And so we're planning on using this money and we're in discussion for, to address the homelessness crisis for affordable housing, the education crisis that we face at you know, the higher ed level, so possibly free community college tuition for every high school graduate in the city of Seattle, because we all know that student loans are out of control. And we plan on possibly using this money for environmental equity and justice, such as the weatherization of low-income households. And so this is a graphic of that proposal. But I, you know, I, I face a lot of skeptics when I'm organizing on the streets. They say Washington hated I-1098. You know, it failed in every single county except for the San Juan Islands. <laughs> and you guys remember that map I showed you back then. Well, look closer. Look even closer. That's Seattle. <laughs> Seattle passed I-1098 a bit, an initiative for progressive taxation on high income households by 63%. And we are, and I think the same amount of support, if not more, is in Seattle today. And we are ready for an income tax in this city. <laughs> but what about the courts, they say? Remember the 1930s? Income is a form of property. It's totally unconstitutional. What are you guys thinking? Breaking the law. Well, I'm here to tell you that the Supreme Court looks and thinks a lot different than they did in the 1930s. These are the Washington State Supreme Court justices that you guys have elected. And we consider, and 
we welcome the lawsuits that the Freedom Foundation will give us because through this, initiative, through this ordinance and this lawsuit, we can overturn the 1930s ruling that income is a form of property and pave the way for an income tax in the state of Washington. And so we consider the Supreme Court justices our friends in high places. So great, how will we do it? Well, how do we do anything in this city? When we, how do we get our elected officials to do anything in this city? Peer pressure, well, we, oh, yes, we organize and we build a movement. And together, our coalition has brought together people who would give up their Sundays at work parties, stand in the rain and march and gather petitions, give up rare sunny days in Seattle, stand in front of the light rail station gathering petitions. And we brought our elected officials into town halls like this to, to listen to experts and community leaders and everyday people and their stories of how a, high, how a regressive tax policy burdens them. And some council members were a lot easier to bring than others. <laughs> and so we took, you know, we got, you know, thousands, hundreds if not thousands of people to share their stories to fight for progressive taxation. And we built a movement that the city council could not ignore, and it worked. On May Day, the council has unanimously passed a resolution to pass an income tax ordinance by July 10th. But it ain't over yet. A resolution is not an ordinance, and it isn't over until the ink is dry in that paper and our city is $175 million richer. And it isn't over until we beat the opposition who can gather, who could possibly gather 10,000 signatures to put this on the ballot. And if we overcome that, it isn't over until we get a favorable ruling in the courts. And it isn't over until, we, not, until a single person, until not a single person exists in Seattle that can be hurt by Trump's agenda. So I want to end this slide by saying, join us on May 31st at the Affordable Housing and the Neighborhoods and Finance Committee led by Tim Burgess. And together, we can end 85 years of tax injustice in our state. So up next, I'd like to introduce you to one of the campaign coordinators of the Trump Proof Seattle Coalition, who is also a resident of the Central District, my friend and the General Secretary of the Transit Riders Union, Katie Wilson. Thank you. Uh Thank you everyone for being here and thank you KJ for that awesome slide presentation. Um, so it has been my privilege over the past uh, several months to help to coordinate this amazing coalition, um, which is winning, I think, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I just want to take a look, though, at um, what this campaign can tell us about the bigger picture of what we're up against. So um, KJ's slideshow there revealed some similarities between the 1930s and today. He said, we have our own robber barons, our own Hoovervilles. Taxes were oppressing working people back then, just as they continue to do today. Our state then was in dire need of new revenue to deal with economic and social crises, just as it is now. And in both cases, taxing the wealthy was the clear answer. But then we get to a big difference. In the 1930s, voters overwhelmingly approved a progressive income tax. In 2010, voters in Washington state overwhelmingly rejected it. Now there's a problem for us, why? And I think the answer is that today, the very wealthy, the corporate and financial elite are more organized than they used to be. And we, the people, are less organized. We got to get our act together. Back in the 1930s, farmers knew that, taxing, that a progressive income tax was the answer because they belonged to the Grange. Who knows what the Grange was? KJ mentioned it. It was a farmer's organization, a statewide organization that created space for farmers to come together to meet, to discuss, to discover their common interests and to act upon them. The Grange teamed up with labor and education associations. They got out there, they gathered signatures, they educated voters throughout the state. Big business could shout out their opposition, but voters weren't swayed because they knew what was up. 
They were hearing it from organizations they trusted, from organizations they were members of, from organizations that represented them. Fast forward to today, it's really hard to know who to trust. It's hard to know which way is up. We're so bombarded by misinformation, distractions and distortions. And in part, that's because there's a lot of organized wealth behind that misinformation. The corporate and financial elite has very effectively promulgated a certain narrative about taxes and government. And they put billions of dollars into convincing people that, for example, if we tax the wealthy, they won't create jobs for us. <laughs> so there's that. But more fundamentally, we're stymied because we are not organized enough to resist that onslaught. Not enough people in our state or even in our progressive bubble here in Seattle are part of organizations that are their organizations, that they have built, that they run themselves. People are isolated, communities are fragmented, and we are far too dependent on the mass media machine for our ideas rather than relying on each other. So we have the form of democracy today, but we don't have the substance. And I believe that that's really the great creative challenge of our time, building up a new infrastructure of democracy. And I think that we have succeeded in this campaign so far precisely because the people and the organizations that have been making this happen understand that this is our challenge today. And so for me, as exciting as it's been to see this campaign go from what looked like a long shot to what is hopefully at this point a sure bet, it's even more exciting to be working with these people and organizations who understand this challenge before us, who are ready to rise to it, and who understand that this won't just be the work of one campaign or a few campaigns, one year or a few years, but perhaps the work of a generation or two generations. So we're in it for the long haul. Thank you for being here, and we hope you'll come with us. Thank you, Katie. Our next speaker is Rami Khalil, who is a resident in District 3 in Seattle, in Capitol Hill, and he's a longtime activist in Seattle for economic and social justice. He has been campaigning for years for a millionaire's tax, and he also was part of the movement that fought for marriage equality and played an important role in the fight for 15. He's also a leading member of Socialist Alternative and a really good friend. Please welcome Rami Khalil. It's great to see everyone here tonight. Um, I want to thank the Trump proof. Seattle Coalition for building this movement, Council Member Kshama Salwant for campaigning consistently for so many years for a millionaire's tax, and most of all, all the activists here in this room tonight that are, that are fighting for taxing the rich right now. And it's because of this movement that we are now on the verge of hopefully passing an income tax in Seattle, all of the grassroots organizers and organizations here that have built this movement. If this tax passes, it would raise $130 million per year. Just last year, we were campaigning to stop the police bunker, the most expensive police station in the country that the mayor and the city council wanted to build, and that was gonna build, that was gonna cost $160 million. And Councilmember Sawant's office did a study that with $160 million, we could build 1,000 homes. So if, if this tax passes for $130 million every year, we could build hundreds of city-owned, quality, affordable housing each year. What do you guys think? Do you think we need more affordable housing in District 3 and across the city? <laughs> With $130 million every year, we could also fund jobs and community programs in neighborhoods where people of color predominantly live, and make childcare more affordable. There's so many things we could do with $130 million a year. But what's crazy to me is just how much poverty and homelessness and inequality there is in this city. This, our economy in Seattle is booming. Seattle has tens of thousands of millionaires. Oxfam International came out with an incredible report last year. I don't know if y'all saw it, but it found that eight individuals in the world 
have the same amount of wealth as half the world's population. Eight men have the same amount of wealth as 3.6 billion people. And two of those people live right here in the Seattle area, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. We have to tax the rich if we want that wealth to benefit all of our communities, right? And it is exciting to me to see after all these years of, of campaigning for a millionaire's tax, to see more and more candidates and politicians coming out in favor of a tax on the rich and that we might actually pass uh, an income tax on the rich in the next several weeks. But we should remember that the only reason that this ordinance could pass is because of the grassroots movement we've built and the grassroots pressure that ordinary people and activists are applying on, on the political establishment. Taxing the rich is an obvious basic initial step to address many of the problems in our city. There's homelessness everywhere, and yet they have, our city politicians have failed so far to tax the rich. The reason why that the city politicians, the mayor and the city council have not so far passed an income tax on the rich is very simple. It's not just in Washington, D.C. that our politicians are controlled by corporations and the rich. It's even in the so-called progressive cities, the blue cities, the Democratic Party-run cities like in Seattle. The, the, the rich people really do run our own local city council right here. They're, and they're used to just running business like that, where they, where they get to control things, where taxes, you know, we, as, as, uh, as the speaker pointed out so well, we live in the most regressive, the, the state with the worst tax structure, the most unequal tax structure in the whole country. Um, so, you know, it's good that we have this movement going, but we do need to keep up the pressure. When this vote comes up before city council, it's very important that all of us that are here tonight go to the city council meetings to put pressure on them to pass the strongest ordinance possible. As Shamo mentioned, already two of the city council members, when the vote came up in the committee, started talking about council member Burgess and council, council member Bagshaw started advocating a flat income tax that would actually disproportionately hit the working class instead of taxing the rich. So we need, to pack, we need to pack the city council chambers when it comes up for discussions and votes. And then, once we hopefully pass it at the city council level, and if the mayor signs it, which he's now finally saying he will, then uh, it is likely to be sued in court, as, as one of the speakers mentioned. But that is not the end of the story. Um, if our movement keeps up, if we keep fighting, if we keep rallying at the, if we pack the courthouses, if we rally outside the courthouse, we can pressure them to uphold the ordinance that we will hopefully pass at the city level. And there's many examples of when things pass of popular protest movements pressuring courts to rule in our favor. Take, for example, you know, there used to be Jim Crow in the South, and through a mass movement of boycotts and strikes, African Americans and their supporters forced the, the courts to, you know, get rid of legal segregation in the South. Same-sex marriage, after decades of campaigning for equal rights for LGBTQ folks, finally the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage. And uh, more recently, when after the women's marches, uh, when Trump was inaugurated, and when thousands of us went to the airports, we were able to pressure the judges to strike down Trump's Muslim visa ban. So just, just because we pass it at the ordinance at the city level and if the, if the courts try to overturn it, that's not the end of the story. Courts can be subject to pressure from popular movements. So will you be there with me when, when we have to go to the courts? So thank you so much for being here tonight, and I just want to end by saying if we keep building these organized movements, grassroots organizations, if we keep fighting, if we stand up for ourselves, we can, we can pass a strong ordinance at city council, and then we can keep it upheld in the courts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rami. So next up, we have Jesse Hagopian. Jesse teaches history and is the advisor to the Black Student Union at Garfield High School. He is a member of the Social Equity Educators, the International Socialist Organization, and editor for the social justice education publication, Rethinking Schools Magazine, and the Seattle Fellow for the Progressive Magazine. Jesse.
Back up, back up. We want freedom, freedom. All these racist tax codes, we don't need them, need them. Back up, back up. We want freedom, freedom. All these racist tax codes, we don't need them, need them. All right, y'all. So I, I drove to work today, and I drove under uh, I-90. <laughs> Sorry, not everyone's with us here. But I, I, I was driving to Garfield where I teach this morning, and I, um, I drove under the I-90 bridge, and I looked uh, out the window, and I saw the grass banks where the grass should have been, but the grass had been bulldozed. And I saw the bulldozer tracks was all that was left of the homeless encampment. I thought the mayor promised us he didn't do sweeps. Am I wrong? I wasn't at the forum, but I heard that Mayor Murray said, I don't do sweeps in this city. That won't happen under my watch. Am I right? Right. So he just lied to you all about that. Um, <laughs> he calls destroying people's lives and, uh, and their self-organization uh, helping. So then I get to Garfield today. And I find out that the district has decided to cut the funds for our collection of evidence courses. And I want to tell you what these courses do. These are the courses for folks that didn't pass the high stakes standardized tests. These are the courses that are filled with mostly black and brown students because the tests don't center their culture, because the tests reflect your access to resources and your proximity to the dominant culture not your intelligence. And so now we have these courses with dedicated educators that work with these kids every day to do an alternative to these high stakes tests where they can show their intelligence and their brilliance and their beauty uh, through collecting their actual work that shows what they're, what they're capable of doing and present that. And our, our school has an incredible track record of getting these kids graduating and walking across the stage with pride and dignity next to their classmates because of those courses. And I found out today that those will be cut from Garfield High School. Right. I mean, the priorities of this city are completely upside down and inside out. How can I assign homework to my students if they don't even have a home? Right? We have, to, we have to talk about how we got here and why we're in the situation where we, we, we can be uh, throwing homeless, we can be evicting homeless people and cutting funds to our schools and letting these billionaires run away with the money. And you can start, you can start with Donald Trump who's proposed a $54 billion increase to the Pentagon to go bomb children across the world rather than to build their schools and, and their, their homes here. And then he proposed a $9.3 billion cut to the Department of Education at simultaneously, right? So we can start at the federal level, but we should know it's not just Trump, right? One, it's been going on for a long time, bipartisan um, attacks. But we should also know that there, in 2015, it was shown that 73% of Fortune 500 companies have offshore tax havens that amount to 7 $718 billion, right? And so we know that that's where the money is, but I just want to end by, by saying that I think that we have to understand the way that economic inequality and racism do not exist on separate tracks, right? They're, they actually mutually reinforce one another, and we have to understand the way that they use racism, the media, the politicians, the richest 1%, to sell their economic agenda. They tell us, why are, why are you unemployed? Well, you're unemployed because that immigrant came across the border and took your job, right? They tell us, they tell us why is there poverty in our community? It's because of the black thug, right? The black criminal that's, that's causing that, right? They tell us, 
They tell us this, why is it that we're transferring billions of dollars from our schools into the Pentagon budget? Oh, that's because we have to, uh, we have to actually keep our nation safe from, from Muslims, right? Those kind of racist lies are what allow them to get away with the biggest wealth drain uh, in human history, stealing from the poor to give to the rich. And I just want to say that we can do all the work we do and create the wealth we do without them. We can teach the kids. We can heal the sick. We can drive workers to their employment. We create all the wealth. Let's keep it for us and use it to help our families and our community. Thank you. Right. Who wishes that they had had Jesse as a teacher in high school? You're so amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And he has to go, so let's all say bye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, now I welcome to the stage Kelly Lyons. Kelly's a longtime leader to expand rights, respect, housing, and shelter options for homeless people in Seattle. When city government support for Cher's indoor shelters dried up last year, Kelly left her tiny house at 22nd and Union to join Tent City 7, the group who led the five-month, 150-person per night sleepout at the King County Administration Building to restore Cher funding to get folks back inside. Kelly. I'm Kelly Lyons, and if you're from this district, I am your neighbor. I currently reside at Nicholsville Tiny House Village over on 22nd. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. Over on 22nd, just off Union. <laughs> Nicholsville tiny house villages are self-managed encampments. If you stop by, you will meet residents of the tiny houses. We provide our own security, organize and maintain the kitchen and donations, and hold elected leadership positions. We have minimal assistance from our two staff members who assist four Nicholsville encampments. Our populace is made up of uh, People, those with health issues waiting on lists for low-income housing and the working poor with jobs or look, look, looking for jobs yet unable to find affordable housing. They say pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We're trying, yet there's no housing to be found. Nicholsville encourages getting involved with the communities we are in and the larger city. That's why you'll see us at local meetings, council meetings, rallies, and marches, all active ways to change and improve our unjust world. Nicholsville has joined the Tax the Rich movement as participants and sponsor. We have not come to ask for lower taxes for ourselves. We have come to ask for justice. It isn't right. It isn't right that there's so much poverty sandwiched in between so much wealth. The argument that it would be a burden for someone who makes a quarter of a million or more to pay 1.5% of their additional unearned income when the lowest income earners are paying more than 16% of their income already is not sound. Or as my grandmother would say, it just doesn't hold water. A wise man once said, from each according to their abilities, to each according to their needs. That's not a bad idea, is it? <laughs> We're not going to achieve it overnight and maybe not in our lifetimes, but it's something worth striving for. This specific proposal for a progressive taxation 
is another step in a positive direction. I feel I'm lucky to be in my tiny, heated tiny house with access to running water, showers, and a flushing toilet. There are thousands in Seattle tonight who will sleep on the street without any of this. They are in real and genuine risk. And as far as the, the mayors talking about these cleanups instead of sweeps, so many people are being swept that we turn away people every day. Our goal at Nicholsville is to get everyone into shelter as soon as possible and then get them out of the shelter and into affordable housing as soon as it's built. Again, this tax proposal is a key part for making this change. I've seen several of you at these meetings, at these meetings and rallies before. I hope the new faces I see will support this new proposal too. We're all working hard to make this proposal a reality and this movement is growing. I want to thank Councilperson Sawant for her support and forward thinking. I'd also like to thank the Trump Proof Seattle Coalition, and in particular, Transit Riders Union Katie Wilson, for, so, for organizing so many to come together, uniting some pretty diverse groups. Our next big step is the City Council meeting on May 31st at 9 a.m. I look forward to seeing many of you there. Look for us in our bright pink Nicholsville t-shirts. Thank you. Woo! Up, people, get up, get up. Thank you. Yes. Okay, when um, activists for the houseless come together with elected officials and community organizers, that is what democracy looks like. Looks like. Tell me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Tell me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy moves like. Thank you. Okay, now I'd like to welcome to the stage my friend and fellow organizer, Jimena Velasquez Arenas from the District 3 Neighborhood Action Coalition, also an organizer for SEIU 775. She's a champion for gender equity, migrant justice, and economic justice. Can we give it up to Nicholsville? We honor the work that you do. We honor the work that you do. So the question I have on my mind today is what is poverty? We've been discussing this for the last couple of months specific to this campaign. And I feel like there are new ways in which we learn how poverty, insidious in its nature, affects us. I just got out of jury duty today. I, I didn't get out of it, but I came from jury duty to this meeting. And what was really disheartening, as someone that works in labor and has been working on issues of anti-poverty for the last three years, I was amazed for the first time being in a courtroom and seeing fellow jurors as myself that were randomly selected that half of the folks that were brought into that room were not able to participate in a process that is supposed to allow, and I put this in big quotation marks because we know that there are problems with the justice system, deep and horrible problems with our justice system, but the fact that fellow jurors like myself, half the room had to vacate and not be able to participate in that movement because a medium-length trial, three weeks of time off from work, 
would have resulted in their eviction if they had homes, or would have resulted in such great a financial burden for them to bear that they in fact could not participate in this process that is supposed to be guaranteed for folks that are innocent until proven guilty. There was no group of peers in this moment to assess the situation because they had to dismiss themselves. They couldn't afford to be in court. And so that's a new realization on a personal level that I'm just walking out of. Now, when we talk about what our response is to that, I thank Daniel for that chant because in fact this and filling rooms like this as the coalition has been doing is where we need to be putting our work and where we need to be putting our effort. And it goes beyond taxes. Because when we think about the work that we're doing in order to not feel, to not see, first of all, the shame of folks that couldn't participate and felt ashamed that they had to leave the room, we have to challenge that at every level. And we do that by making sure that we're reaching out to each other and that we're working in hyper-localized organizing. This is neighbor to neighbor. This is doing direct acts of service. This is plugging in to di the different movements that there are many of are necessary for us to give energy to. And I quickly want to call your attention to an action on Sunday. It's a day of service on Sunday. Where's Carlos Padilla? Carlos left. Oh, it, was, it was their birthday and I wanted to celebrate them. But on Sunday at 5 o'clock, we're going to be gathering signatures for decline to sign on 1552. Super important to make sure that our state doesn't reverse anti-discrimination laws that we've built over the last 10 years. So if you can, can you, who here can make it? Sunday at 5, Cal Anderson. Come gather some signatures with us because this is what community looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Jimena. Our next speakers are Betty and Elmi. They're workers at Security Industry Specialists, which is a company that Amazon contracts with, and they provide security at the Amazon campus. Betty and Elmi are among some really courageous workers who have spoken out against religious discrimination at SIS, and have, they have faced retaliation for working with SEIU Local 6, for fighting back and trying to unionize Amazon security workers. Do we support their struggle to get unionized? Yeah. So Betty and Elmi have joined us here tonight to express their solidarity for taxing Seattle's rich and to build support for their struggle. Please come forward. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, my name is Abdenasir Elmi. Before I even speak, I would like to say a few things. Can you guys repeat something after me? I'm a crazy guy real quick. So when we fight, we win. That's all I want for now. So when we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. Thank you so much. So uh, I've, I've been working at Amazon uh, from 2010 up to 2017 this year. Uh, we basically went through a lot of struggle. Uh, I am a Muslim. I grew up in Seattle, went to Bellevue College, went to University of Washington. I did security so I can pay for my bills and help my family out. And it's very sad to be going to work and you have to hide your religion or you have to hide where you pray at. Uh, believe me or not, uh, for th I'm surprised that I'm still there for seven years. Like, I'm like, really? I was hiding my prayers. I was in the garage praying. Uh, 
I had supervisor coming after me, harassing me about being who I am. When I first applied for the company at SIS, uh, did my resume, went to the interview, got the interview, sat down with someone, talked to me about the job and all that stuff. Comes back and he was like, hey, Mr. Omi, we look at your resume, you are qualified to be with our, with our company. Uh, we would like to have you with this company, but the only problem we have is we would like for you to shave your beard. So I'm like, what? So, first of all, I had to understand that wasn't him. That's the company policy. That's number one. You have to understand where he's coming from. Number two, I had to give him an explanation for order for him to understand where I'm coming from. So this is all I said to him. What I said to him was, look at my resume and read my name. My name says Abdel Nasser Elmi. So do you want me to be John? Do you want me to change who I am and what I believe for order for you to expect me, like, to accept me and to, and to give me a job? And I was like, you know, my man, I will be honest with you. Thank you for this great opportunity. I don't think I'm going to shave my beard for anyone. I don't care how much you pay me. I'm not going to do this. So after a couple of months, after a couple of months, I got the job. Mayday was spoke. Spoke on Mayday, uh, talked about how we're still getting paid 1550 uh, SIS. Uh, we don't get no raises or anything else. So after I spoke, they took me off the schedule. They called me back to the office. They tried to basically shut me up, offering me different things, telling me, hey, we can work on things, blah, blah, blah. And then next thing you know, they'll never get back with you. So that's why we stand up. I'm going to give Betty a little bit. So as Elmi has said already, um, we work for SIS. Um, I've been an officer since August of 2016, so just this past summer. Um, so when I first got hired, I liked the job, liked the pay, couldn't complain about anything. And then I started seeing all the religious discrimination that was going on, uh, not towards me personally, but against my coworkers, uh, which is why I wanted to stand up and join the union and uh, start working with them. And as soon as they, uh, my supervisors, heard about that, um, I, my hours got cut from full time to only 16 hours a week, wow. right? Um, and then that was after the march that we had on March 31st. Um, and then we kept fighting. Um, I did not let that stop me. Um, and then we had the rally on May 1st in which me and Elmi and a couple of other uh, people spoke out against SIS and all of our supervisors, watch commanders and they, you know, they were all in attendance and saw us speaking out. And I kid you not, the very next day, we were both taken off the schedule. Um, <laughs> exactly. So there was 400 Muslims working at, at SIS. And not one of them was able to speak up, to stand up and speak up against SIS because they were all afraid of being retaliated against. So that is why it's very important for all of us to stand together and show them that it's, it's important to, you know, unite because once we do unite, we can, we can exactly, <laughs> we can change it. Um, we actually just got a victory. Uh, we got our prayer rooms, finally. Uh, we weren't allowed to pray. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we did not have a place to pray. Um, and after fighting this long battle, um, I mean, it's still not over, but we finally got something. Um, which is a huge victory. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for fighting and for coming together. And I cannot stress enough how, how important it is for all of us to stand together. Because when we fight, we win. There we go. Thank you guys for everything. Can you imagine the struggle of our sisters and brothers at the Amazon campus? How much money does Jeff, Jeff Bezos need? Just <laughs> beyond the, <laughs> it's, it's leaving me speechless. <laughs> beyond the obscene profits that are uh, made by the Amazon executives, just today there's an article 
in the media about the fabulous lifestyle of Jeff Bezos. But do you know how, that fa how he gets that fabulous lifestyle? By stomping on the very basic rights of the workers at Amazon. And tonight, we are so fortunate. We not only had Elmi and Betty from SIS, we have somebody who is organizing workers at the Amazon warehouse in Bellevue. Amazon warehouse workers, as we know, are some of the most oppressed and most invisible workers. And so we are so thankful that Heidi Kayat, Chayat, sorry, is here to join, uh, to speak to us. So please give a warm Seattle welcome, Seattle working class welcome to Heidi Chayat. You'll have to excuse me, I'm, I'm a longtime activist. My, my son was named John Bernard after Bernie. Um, but I usually work in the background. I'm a school teacher by trade, elementary school teacher, and I'm very good in front of a class of kids. But you know, when the parents come to school, they must think, oh, this is, how is this inarticulate person <laughs> teaching my children? But anyway, um, I also have a degree in, in American history and labor history from Brandeis University. That was my undergraduate degree because I wanted to help people. Um, anyway, I got into a situation where I'm trying to organize the Amazon workers because um, I, I needed a job, a part-time job, um, to take in an exchange student and to send my, so that my daughter, who's working on her international back, could be an exchange student. And what I found inside the warehouse, which I totally did not expect, were working conditions like my grandparents who grew up on the Lower East Side of New York City had to endure when they went to work in the factories as teenagers. Um, some of the things that I witnessed and experienced is first of all, the workers inside the warehouse are not even making as much as security. They're making about twelve fifty an hour, and a lot of them are just really grateful for that money. Some I began there in Thanksgiving. I walked out this past weekend after several workers had been threatened for trying to organize, and I felt it would be best if I left with a clean record um, and tried to organize from the outside. Some of the things that I observed there were. Um, it, First of all, people have to work at incredibly fast speeds that are unsafe, so they get injured. If they don't work at those in insane speeds, they're terminated with cause, so they're not able to collect unemployment compensation. What they do at Amazon is they have safety first all over, and they have safety signs, and when you, you know, get together for your stand-up meeting, how to be safe, how to be safe, but it's all a ruse because that way they can blame the worker if they are hurt. Some of the things that I went through when I was there was I had a breast cancer scare. And so I had to have a biopsy and I needed to take the night off after, I'm fine, I'm healthy, but I had to have a biopsy and I needed the night, I needed the night off because you can't reach, you're supposed to you know, not engage in heavy physical activity after a biopsy. So I had a doctor's note, went into work the next day and was told it was an unexcused absence that it would go towards terminating my employment. Now part-time workers at Amazon, they, they are allowed one 12-hour paid time off. I was just asking for unpaid time off. Nope, they are, and they're supposed to use it, but they only get one 12-hour period, one, oh, one 12 hours per quarter of the year. The rest of the time, if you take time off, even with a doctor's note, it goes towards terminating you. Now, people get really sick there because, as I said, they are injured. They have to take time off. 
Um, one of the things that happened, um, I, I was working in water halfway um, up, up through the halfway up my foot. You know how they spray vegetables in the grocery store? Well, they spray them. So what you're doing is you're, slog you're inside a refrigerator for 10 hours at a time, and you're slogging through water. You're not given protective gear. You're allowed one pair of work gloves a week. It doesn't matter how wet they get, how bloody they get. You still have to work in those gloves inside a refrigerator. So I could go on and on, but Kashama just wanted me to give you a, a brief overview. I feel that, um, I, I, I feel, you know, there would not be a home, one, one of the things that is really aggravating me about Jeff is that he's just generously donated an old warehouse to be turned into a women and children's shelter. They wouldn't need that if, they, if he had employees there who were able, who were earning a family wage. It wouldn't be needed. If I could just tell you one other, just two other ways that Jeff steals money from his workers. One is, okay, so they hire part-time workers. They fire as many as possible. They force part-time workers to work 40 hours a week. That time, it's, it's mandatory. That way, you don't get, um, you don't get benefits. What they do with their very few full-time workers is they, they, um, push them up to mandatory overtime 50 hours a week, and most of them have other jobs because you can't live on that salary. And so that accounts for one-fourth of a worker who's not being paid benefits. Another thing that Jeff does, he's, he's also participating in wage theft. What Sometimes when you scan in, your card doesn't go through that you are there. So we are given a lecture at the beginning of every shift that it is up to you, employee, to make sure that you have that you, you have to check into the computer to make sure that you're on there for the time that you've actually worked. And so one of the reasons I worked, walked out was because I was, about to, I was about to say something, really lose my temper, because several people who were forced to work mandatory overtime, it wasn't put in the computer. So they weren't paid. So anyway, I'll let you go now. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. And we know that Amazon has a particularly rotten track record for its warehouse workers, but let's not make the mistake of thinking that it's a bad apple in a basket full of good apples. This is capitalism. Workers are struggling everywhere. So I wanted to quickly share with you that workers at AT&T locations throughout the nation, 40,000 workers, members of the Communications Workers of America Union, are going to go on strike tomorrow, starting at noon. I would urge as many of us as possible to join them and express our solidarity at the picket line. They're going to be there at noon tomorrow on the corner of Fourth and Pike, just around the corner from Westlake. And also you can follow our, my council office social media for more information. So please join them. And our next speaker is Kayla Nicholson, who is a full-time organizer with Socialist Alternative and Socialist Students. She helped lead student walkouts on Inauguration Day and recently helped, together, helped put together a socialism conference with 600 in attendance along with Democratic Socialists of America, and aimed at developing a strategy to fight Trump while fighting for a world based on human need, not profit. She also helped lead Seattle's historic Fight for 15 through her work on the 15 Now campaign. Please welcome Kaylin. Thank you, Shama. So all of us here this evening and everyone who has just spoken to you are living proof that this movement we have is growing stronger day by day. 
And there should be no doubt in anyone's mind that we are on the right side of history on this one. We create all the wealth in this city through the hard work that we do every day. We prepare the food, we drive the buses, we build the houses, we take care of the sick, the young, and the elderly, we teach the next generation, we repair the roads and the power lines, we collect the trash, we clean the homes and the office buildings, we write the code, we make this city run. And yet, a tiny club of incredibly rich individuals like Bill Gates and Paul Allen and Jeff Bezos use their money and their influence to ensure that the rules of our city favor them and not us. But we are done sitting back and accepting that our city can't afford affordable housing and can't afford paid family leave or free daycare or alternatives to youth incarceration. We are ready to take back some of that wealth that we created with our labor by taxing the rich. We are going to pass this 1.5% tax on incomes over $250,000, and then we are going to fight for a whole lot more. Because, and some other folks have mentioned some of these issues, but it's worth reminding ourselves for a moment just how urgent it is that we win this. Just yesterday, our city's elected so-called leadership allowed another yet another homeless encampment in Seattle to be violently dispersed. That means that last night, dozens more people, dozens more of our neighbors were sleeping unsheltered in dangerous situations on the streets. If Trump's disastrous health care bill passes, then literally thousands of our neighbors and their children will lose everything to medical costs and could easily end up homeless. Technically, we are a sanctuary city. But every single day, immigrant families are being driven out of the city by rising rents. What kind of a sanctuary is that? So we need this money, not only to right the existing injustices in our society, but to defend ourselves against the attacks that we know are coming from the Trump administration. It is not an exaggeration to say that this is a matter of life and death for many people. Everybody here should sign up to get active with the Trump-proof Seattle Coalition. I know someone's going to make a call to action after this. Don't leave before they do that. We need everybody here to get active with Trump-proof Seattle. I encourage you to get active with Socialist Alternative. If you want to see more people like Shama Sawant on the city council, people who lead struggles for the needs of ordinary people instead of having to be dragged kicking and screaming into it, then I encourage you to get active with Socialist Alternative. If we, if we work together, we can make Seattle an example for how cities around this country can wage an effective local resistance to the attacks of the Trump administration. Now, there's a bit of a debate going on right now uh, on the left in society. We all agree that we need to stop Trump, uh, but there's some disagreement about how. Now, I recently went to a town hall meeting where Democratic Representative Adam Smith, who represents the south part of Seattle, was answering questions about how we should fight back against the Trump administration. And he urged the thousand or so of us in attendance to remain patient and to be cautious and to not do anything that might provoke a backlash from the right wing. At Socialist Alternative, we disagree. We think the best way to fight Trump is to build our movement uh, by making bold demands and take, using bold tactics that inspire people and motivate them to get involved and to join the struggle. Demands like tax the rich. And we know from countless examples throughout history and more recently that when we come together around a clear demand 
And when we are willing to use bold tactics like mass rallies and protests and even peaceful civil disobedience that we can win. We can win an income tax, but why would we stop there? We can win affordable housing. We can defeat the youth jail. We can win Medicare for all. We can defeat Trump. Let me tell you, right now things are not looking good for him. He is defeatable. I firmly believe that we can win a socialist society where we'll fi we are finally able to use our wealth and our talents and our energy not to make some rich, greedy thief like Jeff Bezos even richer than he already is, but to create the world that our children deserve to live in. But we can't win that if we don't fight. So let me ask you, are you ready to fight for that world? Thank you. And now stay tuned uh, for a representative from Trump Proof Seattle who's going to tell you how to sign up, how to get active in this fight. Thank you. A lot of people have mentioned the sweeps this evening. There was just a sweep. How many people went there to stop the sweep? Raise your hand. Shama was there. Yep, a few people here were there. So the Neighborhood Action Coalition is organizing people for rapid response to stop the sweeps. We're not going to stop the sweeps by standing in this room and screaming at this microphone. We're going to stop it by going out to where the sweeps are happening. So if you want to get involved in that, then please go to the Neighborhood Action Coalition table right there and sign up for that rapid response. And I, now, yes, thank you. And I would like to uh, now invite Scott Myers up. Scott is lead organizer and a founding member of the Transit Writers Union. He's also a resident of the Central District. Thank you. So uh, it's beautiful to see this group here. We've been having town halls in every district, and this one uh, is just wonderful. Um, it's packed. I suppose it should come as no surprise that uh, the district that elected Shama Sawant to represent them in city council is the most uh, enthusiastically progressive district in the city of Seattle. So uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, money and power. And I'll make this brief. Uh, we live in a society where money equals power. And the people with money have the power. And they set the public policy. They set it at the local level. They set it at the state level. They set it at the national level. And they decide what social services go on the chopping block and who gets taxed and who doesn't and how much. And this being the case, uh, is it any wonder uh, that we have a system where money is a tax system, where money is consistently taken from those who have not enough and funneled into the accounts of those who have already too much. Um, and how do they achieve this? Well, with money, of course. So they hire other people. They hire marketing teams and think tanks and, and uh, media conglomerates, and, and they buy politicians, essentially, uh, all to do their bidding and to sway public policy in a direction that is most favorable to them and their interests. Um, so what's the source of this money power then? It's their ability to command the labor of other people. The power of this dead object, money, over the energies and the skills and the creative power of living human beings. And it works in politics the same way it works in the economic sphere. They hire us to apply our skills and get the work done. And uh, to me, this is, this is a kind of slavery. It, it's not exactly like having the master's whip at your back or something like this, but it's certainly a far cry from working under a condition uh, called freedom. So what would it be to work under a condition of freedom? Well, that's when we work not just because we have to, to get a paycheck, but because we believe in it, because we want to change the world. But uh, in order to change the world, we've got to invoke a, a different kind of power. It's not power over, it's power to. Like the artists, we need to develop the skills in order to create something beautiful and inspiring. And uh, more than this, 
we need to get organized because our canvas is the world and the paintbrush is far too big for an individual to yield, uh, excuse me, to wield. Um, it's by our combined skills, democratically coordinated, that we build this power to change the world. And the Trump Proof Seattle campaign has thus far succeeded only on the basis of building up that kind of power. And it's because of this that we're going to win. But what are we going to win? That depends on what we do. If we just sit here and, uh, or just go home and uh, leave it to them, whoever they are, to get it done, uh, we're going to get something weak. We're going to get something watered down. Uh, we're going to get something compromised. And moreover, uh, whatever we win is going to be challenged in the courts. We know this. So uh, if we want to win, in the meantime, uh, we need to continue building and fighting, winning new victories, growing a movement that can show our elected and appointed officials, if you fail to represent the interests of the people, there will be consequences. Yeah. Now... Considering everything I've said about uh, power and money, it may seem ironic that we're building up all this people power in order to win, what? Money, yeah. <laughs> um, increase funding for public services, you know? Uh, when you think about it a bit, though, it's not really all that strange. Uh, one day, human beings will be able to live and work in complete freedom, and uh, money will no longer be necessary. But in the meantime, uh, we have yet to overcome this basic condition where uh, the people with the money command those with the skills and the energy in order to make profits. Um, and we have yet to achieve that state where money is merely a tool that human beings use to serve human needs. And though it will be a long, hard struggle before humanity, human society uh, can actually work that way, the power is in your hands to make this principle a reality in practice today. Um, and this isn't going to happen if, you know, just by donating and, and giving someone money and then going home to watch Netflix or something. Um, it's it's going to happen by getting involved, uh, by doing things you've never done before, learning new skills, talking to people, uh, building new relationships, breaking down the walls that the marketplace ha has erected between us in order to squeeze more money out of us. So, oh, thank you. Um, so there's a whole lot of ways to get involved. Uh, we've got these pamphlets. The next thing that we're doing is a town hall on uh, May 22nd. Uh, you can see more stuff that we're doing. Um, if you want to get more involved too, you can uh, fill out these cards here and you can check. Uh, please contact me. We'll, we have organizers. They'll give you a call by, within a few days, probably by next Wednesday at the latest. We've got a whole bunch of stuff that uh, uh, we're going, doing over this weekend uh, to prepare for Monday. Um, but, uh, yeah, so... Um, Thanks again for coming out and doing your part to build up the power to change the world. Let's keep fighting and let's win this in July. Thank you. Yay, awesome. Um, real quick before Shama closes this out, uh, and also we have the questions, so uh, if you ask the question, we're, we're probably not gonna get to all of them, but um, stick around after uh, Shama's closing remarks, we're gonna get to some of those questions. Uh, but real quick, before I say that, uh, before we, uh, we do that, um, we are also going to be handing out vegan burritos. The Neighborhood Action Coalition will be handing out vegan burritos for people who can't afford to eat in Capitol Hill. That's at 5 p.m. Uh, this Sunday in Cal Anderson. We mentioned that we're going to be collecting signatures for Decline to Sign. We're also handing out vegan burritos, so come to that. I was telling Daniel, I especially like the vegan part of it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not campaigning for veganism. <laughs> so sisters and brothers, this has been an incredibly energetic rally. And I want to say, now I've, I've been on the city council now for close to three and a half years. Uh, all the council members are Democrats. There's no Republicans, except for me, I'm a socialist. I'm a member of Socialist Alternative. And what have we observed in the three and a half years that we've been in City Hall? We've seen the so-called Seattle process, the Seattle process where the majority 
of the city council, which is corporate politicians, they say, you know, they'll use these keywords. They'll say, well, we need to be data driven. <laughs> They say, they say we need to be data-driven. They say we need to be thoughtful. I often hear from them that I'm being brash. They say we need more studies about that. That's what they said when we were fighting for 15. You know, they said they need more studies to show, to prove that low-wage workers actually need higher wages and that the sky was not going to fall down. They say they need more studies for uh, uh, really having progressive taxation, for family leave, for renters' rights. They say that those of us who demand that things move fast are not good at policy. And so, on the whole, this Seattle process means a can't-do attitude. But you know what's most striking about this Seattle process and can't-do attitude? is that it does not apply neutrally to everything. When Amazon wants an alley vacation, which is a road reorganization, to accommodate its shiny new campus so that it can exploit more workers, they get a red carpet welcome and that policy is rushed through. There was no Seattle process for Amazon and there never has been. When the council members and the mayor wanted to spend a whopping $160 million on the police bunker for the North Precinct. There was absolutely no process. It was rushed through. And there's been no process for the youth jail, where the proposal is that the county will spend more than $200 million to lock up young people. And many speakers talked about the sweeps. I was there, along with many of you, at the I-90 sweep a couple of days ago. Do you know how many sweeps the mayor, who, as Jesse said, promised in his candidate forum recently that he's not carrying out sweeps or he won't carry out sweeps, do you know how many sweeps of homeless people were carried out in last year alone? 601 sweeps of homeless people. So this is not a lack of money or resources that is driving the inequality in our city. It's the lack of political will and priorities that are overwhelmingly disproportionately skewed towards the super wealthy and big business. But something's changed in the last few years. We won the historic $15 an hour victory that has now gone nationwide. We won renters' rights. We won the landmark cap on move-in fees for renters last year. We successfully pushed back against 400% rent hikes at public housing of Seattle Housing Authority. And, and we succeeded in blocking the bunker. But why have we been able to do this? We've been able to do this because we are starting to build a grassroots movement that is independent of what's acceptable to corporate politicians. We are we're doing this because our movement has an unambiguously loyal voice in City Hall through my office. But as Kaylin said, this divide between corporate politicians, the big businesses that they represent, and the rest of us who struggle for survival, this is not just a local phenomenon. This is happening nationally as well. And the need for movements to be independent of corporate politicians is so evident now more than ever. 
as Trump, as Trump's administration is starting to disintegrate. At the same time, we hear from prominent Democrats that it is not the right time to fight for the needs of working people. The most prominent Democrat, Nancy Pelosi, said single-payer health care is not going to be on the Democratic Party platform. She also said that her guess was that the Democrats lost the presidential election last year because they didn't cater enough to the social right wing and that going forward, being pro-abortion rights should not be a requirement to Democratic primaries. But it's not just her. We are saying, our movement is saying, why don't we fight for single-payer health care in states that are not controlled by Republicans? But the governor of our state, Washington state, which is not dominated by Republicans, Democrat Jay Inslee said, it's not the right time. And I am reminded so strongly of the quote by Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, that when I hear liberals say, wait, wait, I hear never, never. And so, whether it is to tax Seattle's rich, or to win family leave, or to win funding for public education, or to win affordable housing, or for single-payer health care. There is one common thread that runs through all these movements, that we will have to build them independently in a united way across Democrats, socialists, other activists, LGBTQ activists, environmental activists, but with the understanding that the unity should be amongst one another, not unity with corporate politicians. And so, as, as was mentioned before, we know Trump is defeatable. There is no better starting point to begin that by winning a tax the rich ordinance in Seattle. Thank you. We win! Woo! Yay! Yay! Awesome. Okay. We have time for some of your questions. Um, so a few of them, I think some people didn't quite understand what the proposal was. So I can answer a couple of these really quickly. Will the tax cover capital gains and regular income? Yes. Did you consider reducing the tax on low income citizens? That is in consideration still. Uh, uh, the coalition is not pushing for that at the moment, and that's only because this is the first step in a many-step process, and this is probably not going to be as legally defensible when it goes to the Supreme Court if that's written into it. So, but that's still being ne negotiated, so if you have a very strong opinion about that, you should be at the negotiation table, and you should be showing up May 31st in City Council Chambers with your public comments ready. <laughs> um, Another person asked about uh, proposing tax brackets instead of a flat 2.5% for income above $250,000. So that's not what's being proposed. What's being proposed are, is a progressive income tax. So 1.5% tax on people who earn $250,000 or more, and then 3% 3, 3 so more for uh, top earners, for millionaire couples and individuals earning $500,000. Um, so some other questions that we have are, how are the mayor or city council trying to water down our tax legislation? I think, Shama, you could probably answer that one best. Did you want me to repeat it? Or uh, how, are they how are the mayor or city council trying to water down our tax legislation? Well, right now, uh, they aren't explicitly trying to water it down, and that is only thanks to how powerful our coalition has been. I will say this. We should remain vigilant because the discussions haven't really gone to the point where I, I wouldn't be surprised if I hear some of the council members start saying, well, I support this, but we don't have a legal path right now, or now is not the right time. I support this, but you know, maybe we should do it this way or that way. Well, if we want to make sure that they don't succeed in watering it down, then we should keep building our movement. 
and please, uh, please come to City Hall and add your voice. And I really echo what Daniel was saying, that when we send out our email notifications or social media notifications for people to join us, we're not just saying that just like that. It's when we pack City Hall with the voice of working people, that's when we see the results. Yes. Awesome. Okay. I have a question for Katie. How will the decision be made on how to spend this tax revenue? Can we prioritize the most vulnerable homeless people outside who are dying at a higher rate than ever before? Okay, so um, first of all, just to add to what Daniel was saying before, in that uh, yellow pamphlet that you had on your seat, the inner sheet, one side of that um, shows exactly what we're proposing in terms of the income thresholds and the tax rates. Um, and so see if you can sort of decipher that. In terms of revenue dedication, um, we are still having those discussions within the coalition and with the, the city council members. And as Daniel alluded to, um, the, uh, the sort of attorney team that's been working on this um, think that putting the revenue Revenue toward some of the urgent needs that our city faces is going to make for a stronger pathway going through the courts than if we were to, for instance, like offset the sales tax or something. Now again, this is a first step, so assuming we make it through the legal process, then we can talk about that bigger uh, restructuring of our tax system and using a progressive income tax tool to you know, really dramatically reduce sales tax, not be so reliant on property tax, etc. So as for what urgent needs, uh, the, the revenue is going to go toward. I mean, I think affordable housing and homelessness are very high on the list as we've been having these discussions. Um. And also, as, as uh, I think KJ mentioned in his slide presentation, uh, some education-related things like the idea of free community college. So still under discussion, by May 31st, we should have figured out, hammered out a proposal. Um, and uh, yeah, housing and homelessness on, on, the, on the radar. <laughs> OK, uh, this one. Both Katie and Shama can answer this one. How can we best influence the city council members who are not 100% in support of this tax initiative? Yeah, I think, you know, just what's been said, just keep showing up. Um, and those pledge cards that you had on your seats, so what we're doing with those is we're creating a huge banner uh, that we're going to bring to the city council on uh, May 31st and unfurl around the back of council chambers. It's going to be pretty massive. So make sure that you fill one out. There's also a sign-up sheet somewhere for a, a sort of a work party we're going to be having the evening before. We're going to be finishing constructing that banner. Um, you know, if it turns out that a council member or two needs some extra pressure, Pressure. We might, you know, send an email out at, or asking people to call their office, um, that kind of thing. So we'll sort of play it by ear and see who needs that uh, kind of extra support. Yeah, I also just want to add to that. Um, there have been, so most of the city council members have said that they are in support of this. One city council member in particular, Deborah Juarez, uh, has been uncommittal. She d was not there when the resolution was passed May 1st, and there's a town hall being planned in her district, District 5, on Monday. She has not said she's coming. She said that she's uncommittal on this, so we need to keep the pressure on District 5's City Council member, Deborah Juarez. Um, and Shama has something to add, too. I... I, I really agree with what Daniel and Katie were saying. I just wanted to add just... A, 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 a story, uh, when we uh, fought for and won the city to divest from Wells Fargo recently, we, we had to build a really powerful movement because in the back rooms, I mean, it, council members would say all the right things in, in, in front of cameras in City Hall, but you know, we know what's happening in the background and they were not going to support it. Most of them, the vast majority of them were not going to support it. So what we did was exactly what our Trump-proof Seattle coalition is doing, which is continuing to keep the pressure on. And even though, and see, this, this today's town hall, a District 3 town hall, is a great example of this. Even though the majority of council members have said they support taxing the rich, we're not just less resting on our laurels. We are continuing to build the pressure. And we made sure, uh, our coalition and my office made sure that we had a very, 
good turnout today, and we're making sure that everybody is looked in and keeps coming to City Hall. But one thing that we did in the Wells Fargo battle was uh, we not only packed City Hall every time there was a meeting, but we had a nationwide campaign of calling in, and it was so effective that we had some of the council members, I, they, will, they shall remain nameless, who came to me and said, can you please have them stop? And we said, absolutely not. So, so I, think, I think that we can use all kinds of tactics, showing up to City Hall, having a, but not individuals, just individually in an atomized way doing phone calls, but an actual phone call campaign where you bug the hell out of them. Thank you. Yay. Uh, I will also add, everybody rack your brain and think, who do you know who lives in Northgate and Green Lake? That's District 5. If you're really passionate about this, call that person, text that person, tell them that they need to be there. They need to make sure that their council member is going to be in support of this. So we're really lucky here in District 3 that we have Shama Sawant leading this, uh, but that's not the case for every city council district. When does that come out? That's uh, Monday. That's on, it's on the back of your yellow thing. Yeah, it's on, uh, yeah, and also at the Transit Writers Union table, you can sign up for volunteer shift for it. So, um, great. So one more question. Uh, and this one, uh, probably somebody saw, a friend of mine might have asked this, probably somebody saw my Facebook video, which was about how this is a moderate proposal and the language around it sounds very radical. Um, should we center that with more conservative, moderate voters and council members? Um, I would say it depends on your audience. Um, I mean, in conversations that I've had with people, sometimes uh, I'll say, like, we need to tax the rich now. And sometimes I'll say, like, we need to like redistribute wealth and we need to like tax wealthier people so that we can like provide vital services for lower income people. So it just depends on who you're talking to, but other people probably have something to say about that. We need a great American housing build out without any nonprofits getting in the way. I really agree with Daniel. I think we should, uh, you know, we should be firm in demanding and building to win tax the rich, but we can be. Uh, you know, multifaceted in how we make those arguments depending on our audience, and that's a skill that we all have, we are, many of us are developing as activists, and uh, that's, and that's a, an absolutely critical skill. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, I, I think this applies to the entire city, but I can confidently say, I mean, it, it applies to the entire city because as uh, KJ mentioned, the failed initiative from 2010 actually passed with flying colors as far as Seattle voters are concerned. But in 2015, I ran my re-election campaign through District 3, and our main slogan was tax the rich. And we won our campaign, our movement's campaign for District 3 election, won decisively. So I would say as far as District 3 is concerned, we already have a strong referendum in favor of taxing the rich. And so as far as many working people, renters, homeless people, many social justice activists are concerned, actually I would say that uh, we would, um, it would not be beneficial for us by moderating the language in the sense that they want to tax the rich. If we don't say tax the rich, they might think that we are also trying to tax other people, working people, middle class people. We want to make it clear, regardless of what our starting point is in the conversations, and as I said, we should feel free to be flexible what that starting point is, but we should make it clear we are talking about taxing those who have so much money that it is well beyond what they need for their living needs. All right. Well, I'll see you guys all May 31st. Actually, I'll see you guys on Sunday at, in Cal Anderson Park handing out vegan burritos. And I'll see you at the next sweep, too, because you're going to sign up to stop the sweeps. And then I'll also see you May 31st. That's all. Thank you, everybody.